Let me first uh, welcome you all uh, this evening. My name is David Staley, uh, professor in the Department of History and uh, director of the Goldberg Center, which is the department's uh, digital public history center. And the CLIO Society is uh, the name of this lecture series, which connects uh, department faculty and graduate students to the wider uh, community. CLIO named in honor of the Greek muse of history. Uh, this society, the CLIO Society, seeks to promote the lifelong learning of history for personal enrichment and to engage students, colleagues, and friends in the exchange of information and ideas about history outside the realm of traditional academic classes. CLIO Society was uh, uh, the driving force behind the CLIO Society were two of our distinguished alumni, uh, Steve uh, Millett and Craig Zimper, who is uh, joining us in the audience this evening. Very happy that Craig is here, both of whom with a passion for history that I know is shared by everyone in this room. Uh, Steve has said of the CLIO Society that if you loved history as an undergraduate, then you're going to love it now. I think that's clearly the case this evening as well. Once again, very happy to be uh, uh, hosted by the, the Western Library, uh, rather than say a location on campus. This is our effort to reach out even further into the community that we serve. Uh, the History Department takes the land grant mission of the university very seriously. And I hope you see the CLIA Society lectures as proof of that commitment. Uh, for videos and others in this series, uh, if you uh, go to clio, c-l-i-o, uh, clio.osu.edu, you can see uh, previous videos in our lecture series. And I note that our next lecture, the last one of this academic year, uh, will be uh, next month, Monday, April 18th. In this room, my colleague, Professor Jane Hathaway, will present the history of radical movements in Islam. I understand we have flyers in the back there if you're interested in picking up one of those. Uh, very pleased to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Patrick Papiandi. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in our department and uh, happy to say he will be defending his dissertation in two weeks' time. He will soon be Dr. Papiandi. Hey. <laughs> if I have anything to say about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm on his committee, so. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll talk about what he's doing his dissertation on, but I want to draw attention to the fact that for a number of years now, he has been the managing editor of our monthly e-magazine, Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective. When I say managing editor, that does not convey at all uh, the amount of work and uh, the amount of energy he devotes to that monthly magazine. Again, I point everyone to uh, origins.osu.edu for our free uh, publication. He, in addition to being managing editor, he was he is the host, producer, really, I think, the founder of our History Talk podcast, which is also found on the Origins site. Uh, as I said, uh, he uh, is defending his dissertation in two weeks' time. It's titled Making, Preserving, and Redeveloping Public Housing in the United States. He is a specialist in urban and education history, as well as the history of race. He uh, uh, is dedicated to public history, is, as I said, served as manager, uh, managing editor of Origins, but is also involved in many other uh, public history public history initiatives, especially around Poindexter Village, which you will be talking about this evening. I am very pleased to welcome Patrick Patandi. Uh, thanks to the Clear Society for inviting me here uh, to speak, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I'm excited to talk to you tonight about um, uh, parts of my dissertation research um, and a lot of aspects that I find most interesting about it here. Uh, how I actually came to this topic, I think, tells me a little bit about why it's so important. Um, I actually had a whole other dissertation topic ready to go, set up. It was on uh, Chicago public education. It was a great topic. I had already done a big research trip there. Um, but since moving to Columbus, I moved to Columbus in 2009, um, and just in the news, kind of casually reading about it, I picked up new stories um, that looked a lot like this. Um, this one, though, was from 2012, but a lot of stories looked like this about uh, a conflict going on on the Near East Side about a place called Point Extra Village that I didn't really know that much about. Um, but I kind of continuously just kind of followed it on my own. 
And eventually, I kind of figured out that what it was about, that there was a uh, housing authority here, that um, CMHA for short, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, that had decided to demolish uh, Point Extra Village, the city's first in all black public housing development, which I'll be speaking about mostly tonight. Um, and I kind of looked into it more and more, and I realized that there was a real story here, that there was both a story about a public history controversy about historic preservation, um, but then there was also a rich history behind it that I was completely unaware of. Um, I actually live a few blocks away from Point Extra Village, um, and by the time I really became aware of the place, it was shuttered up, it was boarded up, people had been moved out, um, as you'll see in some later shots here coming up. Um, and I kind of had unconsciously absorbed the common sense of our times, right? Which led me to ask a question, well, why would we want to preserve such a place? I knew nothing about this place. Um, I just knew that there were some community stakeholders here who were really dedicated to saving this place and preserving its history. Um, and so I went and honestly asked this question and really wanted to find out the answer to it. Um, here we see uh, a shot down below the Point Extra Village's kind of uh, back um, kind of streets here into the backyards. Each unit had its own front and back door. Um, eventually, as you'll see, I'll, as I'll talk about, I found a rich history that had many forgotten, that many had forgotten or overlooked. Columbus African Americans built up a neighborhood in the face of racial segregation. Point Dexter was built and designed on a human scale to offer modern housing for a neglected part of the city. African American residents formed a vibrant, strong community. They turned in that they turned as they turned the housing into homes. And then I also found that they found value in the structures because of this overlooked history, their connection to the place. They built value and meaning into the place, which then led them to the public history fight. And so in the last couple decades, though, if you've read about public housing in Columbus, it's probably looked a lot like this. I mean, it's just a smattering of the headlines that I, you know, you can easily find by Googling it, right? You see things like, um, Columbus Public Housing's crime buster, Gary McCants is going after drug dealers, 1989. Or 20 of the 26 low-income housing developments plan special events like the March Against Crime. These are the sorts of things you would read about about public housing if you were uh, looking at uh, public housing as an issue. And so that public housing has failed is today's conventional wisdom. And I'm going to... Uh, I have to take some drinks of water here as I was recovering from a sore throat this last few days. Forgot to mention, he's a, he's, so, a, he's a new father, and so he's not getting sleep either. And, 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 and the kids bringing home all sorts of diseases from daycare um, that I then get to experience firsthand. Um, but uh, feeling all right tonight, so we'll see how long this goes. Um, but that public housing has failed is today's conventional wisdom. Um, so what do, we, what do we mean by stereotypes of public housing? Let's kind of set out some of this here at the start. There's kind of a general condemnation here, right? Um, the Editors of Public Housing Myths, a new volume um, that really gives a great history about public housing, where public housing history kind of sits today, right? That analysts from a surprising range of political ideals, that is just both the left and the right, agree that public housing as built has almost no redeeming features. And Howard Husock, the director of public policy case studies at Harvard, wrote in uh, his great uh, book, uh, America's Trillion Dollar Housing Mistake, that, quote, everyone knows how quickly housing projects in big cities turn into dangerous, demoralized slums. Um, and so when we talk about public housing in the United States, though, we generally talk about um, exceptional examples, right? Um, on your left here is pruitt Igo in St. Louis. Um, on the right here are Robert Taylor Holmes. Uh, this is the cover of Arnold Hirsch's, Hirsch's book, um, The Making of a Second Ghetto. Um, you kind of get the sense of what he's talking about when he's talking about that book. We talk about towers and giant developments often, right? Um, here we see New York, as you can probably guess, right? We talk about them being socially isolated from the surrounding neighborhood and everyone else, from the streets, the stores, uh, the community around them. Here's another shot of Chicago on the south side looking north, right? You can see the loop up at the top. Um, we kind of assume that they've already failed by the 1970s, certainly already, right? If not before, that they've already failed by the 1970s. And that 
we kind of associate them with crime, drugs, welfare dependency, and usually communities of people of color, right? Um, and does anyone uh, here recognize the shot I have chosen to represent uh, this last slide? Yes. Jim, I think, does Jim? Do you want to say it here for us, point it out? Uh, well, that's the bunk on the right. <laughs> okay, let's go more general here. Okay, it's from the wire. It's from the wire. Um, it's from public housing in Baltimore. Uh, yes, exactly. So they're sitting in front of public housing in Baltimore, right? Here, uh, the two uh, gentlemen on the outside are, are police detectives, right? Um, and this is the sort of kind of image we get of public housing, um, however great the wire is as a, as a television show. Um, but that leads me into here, uh, sorry my heading got a little high there. Um, we're kind of steeped in our popular culture about this, right? Um, and there's a great scene, uh, opening scene to season three of The Wire, where these two characters, long established African-American characters, Bodhi and Poot uh, on your left and right there, um, are walking up to uh, this big event that Baltimore City is holding. And they're going to demolish these big towers in Baltimore. And everyone's kind of come out to see this, and they're walking towards the event and talking about it. Um, and they really cut to the heart of the controversy about how some folks are really connected to public housing as a place that they value, and how urban redevelopers think about public housing as kind of places that we can raise again, even though we've raised the communities multiple times. Right? So Pooh says, I don't know, man. I'm kind of sad. Them towers be home to me. But Bodhi says, you're going to cry over a housing project now? Man, they should have blew, blew them up a long time ago, you ask me. Poop, some things happen up in them towers that still make me smile. You all talking about steel and concrete, man. No, man, I'm talking about people. Memories. That ain't the same. People, they don't care about people. Um, and you can probably tell there, uh, uh, I would have shown the scene you can find on YouTube if you want to go find it. Um, but the sheer amount of swearing in the, in the two minutes as they walk towards the scene, I decided it was better to put it in a kind of a script form here for us. But you can kind of see the two contrasts here, right? Um, is it just steel and concrete? Or is it a place that's kind of has value uh, embedded in it by people, right? Or you can look at Show Me a Hero, right? Looks at public housing in the 1980s. But while that is some history, that really doesn't go back far enough, right? If one of our assumptions is already that it's failed by the 1970s, and this show also really only looks at kind of those towers again, again in New York, Yonkers. Uh, the last example I'll point to here is uh, Chicago Community Puts Mixed Income Housing in the Test, a uh, report by Cheryl Corley on Morning Edition on NPR a year ago. Lothrop Homes is looking at a similar uh, development crisis. The community there, an actually racially diverse community, uh, does not want to move out. Lothrop happens to sit in an area of land right on the river that is highly prized by urban redevelopers. Um, they are being pressured to move out. Folks there don't want to move out. Um, as of the end of 2015, um, it was kind of unclear what was going to happen to the buildings with the plans going on there. But this brings us to Poindexter Village, which is very much different from those stereotypes that I highlighted so far, um, but holds some of those similar themes that I mentioned uh, here with Lothrop Holmes or with the scene with Bodhi and Poot from The Wire. Uh, Point Dexter Village, it was built and uh, completed in 1940. Um, it opens in the summer there. It's uh, 33 housing developments originally, um, housing units, uh, buildings originally, with 426 units. And so here you can see here's a uh, structure, 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 right? Um, and to orient everyone, this is North Champion, right here. Long Street would be about right here. Okay. Mount Vernon would be up here, just off your screen. Um, here's the Baptist Church that is still there. It was there before Point Exeter Village was built, and it's still there today. Uh, the administration building, um, here's kind of the steps that lead up to it. That'll be, um, I'll mention that again in a second. And the old uh, junior high school that used to be there, but is now demolished. Um, what, what school, what building is that one? This one, this was a Champion Middle School. I think it was still called Champion then. Um, it's now called Champion Middle School, but it's built over here um, to kind of orient everyone. Um, and I think this was demolished about 2010? Later than that? I think a little later than that. Right. Rita's the local historian expert. She's going to help us out here. Um, 
she will be quoted later as well in the talk. Um, and so, uh, so just kind of orient everyone there. Um, two more housing structures were added um, in later years in 1960. Um, so we're clearly talking about a different form of public housing than these really exceptional city uh, towers in the park sort of places that usually come into our imagination when we talk about public housing. Uh, we see Lothrop Homes in the top left, Santa Rita Courts in Austin, Texas in the top right, um, housing project that uh, representative, then representative Lyndon Johnson championed and helped get built. Um, here we see some children standing in front of the single story there. Here we see the three-story Iberville public housing in New Orleans. Um, and you'll kind of notice too, as I talk about these, and it will become clear as I go through, um, all of these projects are built exclusively for one racial group, right? Iberville is for whites. Santa Rita Courts is uh, for Mexican Americans only. Uh, Lothrop. Um, is escaping me actually who it was originally built for. Um, and Point Extra Village was built exclusively for African Americans in Columbus. So here we can see a direct comparison of what these sorts of footprints look like. Point Extra Village on the left, we have two story high buildings. Um, Pruitt Igo, post war, right? Post World War II. Buildings on the right, also 33 housing structures, but all 11 stories high, right? Um, 2,800 some units, I believe, versus 400 units on, on there. Um, and here we kind of see what it looks like on the ground levels as well. So these, Point Extra was just one of many public housing developments built across the United States between 1933 and 1949. Here's the spread of them. Um, there were uh, a little over 700 built. Um, so this is not a minor institution, right? This is uh, housing that was built um, across the United States, including in some of its possessions or colonies, depending on what you want to call those. What were the goals of New Deal public housing, right? Um, we have affordable housing for the working class, right? Um, this is one of some of the misperceptions of especially earlier public housing. It was not built for necessarily for the poorest poor, right? This is built for working people, people who have jobs already, um, folks who can pay a certain amount of rent, right? Housing authority is going to rely on that rent to run its, its buildings. It's modern housing in place of the slums. The goal was to create immediate jobs, especially during the Depression, right? Design livable, human-scale housing. Uh, conduct slum clearance, right? Uh, this is something that real estate interests especially got put into the legislation. You would have to eliminate the same number of units as you built in an area because they didn't want the challenge um, in the housing market. Um, and the federal government decided not to challenge racial, racial segregation patterns that were already existing, right? Um, and this is where, depending on where you fall as a historian, the federal government either chose not to or would not challenge racial segregation with their housing program. Um, and so here we see Af uh, African American housing built for um, the black community in Columbus on the Near East Side. Um, that community had already established itself there. It was predominantly an African American community. They built public housing there. It was for African Americans. So they go about constructing Point Extra Village. They provide jobs here. We can see in this just great shot in the lower left here. They provide jobs for folks on the ground. And we can see a really great kind of perspective here on what it looked like as it was being built. Um, some of this detailing here is done in copper, these railings, um, and the uh, awnings there above the doors. And we can see some of the uh, design drawings here of this housing, um, done in a very kind of attractive deep red brick color um, that again is kind of on a human scale. Everyone's going to have their own front door, their own back door. Uh, really a step up from the housing, physical housing conditions that they had before. And so that's where I'm going into now, here. And um, so I'm emphasizing here changing a neighborhood because there was already a neighborhood in place that Poindexter kind of lands on top of and moves out. Um, there were 370-some housing units that are uh, 
uh, displaced, right, demolished, and then the folks living there um, are moved out. Um, but for this section, I really wanted to kind of focus more on the physical housing conditions that Poindexter improves upon. Um, so housing numbers were lacking for African Americans in the 1930s. So in part because of racial restrictions, a 1936 survey found only 100 units open for black residents out of 9,000 total occupied by black residents, making a 1.1% open housing rate, which is an incredibly low housing rate if you're a real estate agent or um, an urban planner in, a, in, urban, in the city. Um, in 1936, 43% of all dwellings occupied by African Americans needed major repairs. 11% or 1 in 10 were unfit for use at all. On blocks where Point Extra Village would be constructed, between 81 to 100% of the housing was either unfit for use or needed major repairs. Um, these blocks could only boast uh, <clears throat> flush toilets and 6 in 10 of units, 6 in 10 of the units, while some blocks had 90% of housing with no flush toilets. And so even in census tracts that were just nearby, right next door to Point Extra Village, um, that were actually slightly more racially mixed, about 40% African American, 60% white. Um, the white community being dispersed between native born and foreign born. Blacks tended to occupy older housing, ones with lack of electricity and with a coal stove instead of a modern furnace for heating. Only 68% had a bathroom, which was defined as a bathtub with, uh, and a sink with running water, while over 86% of whites did. 68% of blacks could claim an inside toilet, while over 90% of whites could. Um, and so that's the sort of housing here. We see a young boy here drinking out of a water uh, pump outside, out back of his house. And, and this- That is the, the uh, Blackberry Patch there? Yes, and so this is the name of the neighborhood that um, Point Dexter Village really displaces um, and is really celebrated in Nina Robinson's artwork mm -hmm. um, that, uh, there's already an established neighborhood there that Point Dexter displaces. Um, and so this is gonna be a series of before and after shots to kind of show us a comparison between the before housing and the after housing provided by Point Dexter Village. And these, all these shots were taken from approximately the same location, right? So here we see kind of an upper shot, I believe this was taken on actually the top of the school, looking down to kind of a back alley. You can see how close the buildings are pu uh, pushed together. This is taken of uh, similar. This sh shot on the top was actually taken from so far away. It's of the playground. But this is a much better shot of the playground that's provided at Point Extra Village. Yes? Are you, are you taking questions throughout? Or you Definitely, to, yeah. What's yeah. your preference? Do you have a preference? Uh, no preference if you want so, to move so to now. The, 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 of the displaced families, how many of them were afforded access in the redeveloped village? That's a good question. I never found that out. Um, this goes did in... They seek, did they seek habitation in the redeveloped village, or were they just was there sort of a diaspora all over the city? What I mean? um, so uh, I'll show a map in a second here of where a majority of the residents who were displaced find resettlement within a mile and a half of where they were displaced from. Um, I never found exact numbers of how many of those found housing in the village because, um, how do I say this delicately, um, the housing authority did a very poor job preserving their historical records. Um, there are about three boxes of this big that they saved from before the 1980s, and that's it. Um, so most of the data I have on there, um, on these places, are from social scientific surveys, from you know Ohio State master's theses or doctoral dissertations, um, city real estate surveys, that sort of thing. Um, so I kind of have some facts and figures on some of that, but a lot of, a lot of it I just can't know yet, um, and unfortunately. Rita, have a question? And Anna Bishop, Dr. Anna Bishop from Ohio State, did extensive uh, writings about the Blackberry Patch and Point Dexter. And in one of her publications, she lists all of the persons that originally went back into the, the community. So most of the people were um, relocated back into the village that were displaced. And they did do a fairly uh, rigorous, um, I guess, testing 
for who could get access into the village too, right? Um, you had to be employed, you couldn't be on public relief rolls, that sort of thing. Um, that sort of reviewing was going on. Um, so here we see another kind of uh, street of crowded housing, right? So no grass. What year would that have been? So these were taken in 1936. Okay. And then the after is taken in 1940, sorry. Here we see before, uh, two girls washing in the tub outside. The house behind them has no shingles, right? The house they're right next to seems to be in disrepair. And then afterwards we see rose bushes, we see clean laundry out of the lines. Again, another house in terrible repair. And here we see brick patios, children playing out front. Um, tricycles left on their own in front of units, those sorts of things. Uh, here we see the back of one unit, um, probably an outhouse with debris. Um, in the yard, two children here, this with a woman, um, and someone standing on the back, sitting on the back porch. Um, replaced by more open spaces with grass, courtyards in between units, um, a lot of thought given to landscaping and the like. I think this is the last before and after. We can kind of see the contrast between what sort of a porch you kind of prefer to maybe sit on and relax in the evening. And so Point Extra was placed inside a long established African American neighborhood known as the Blackberry Patch. Um, and these are th uh, three maps that uh, I developed by mapping um, a couple hundred. Uh, black run businesses in Columbus. The top row of maps is 1913, and as we move from left to right, it zooms in further into um, the Near East Side. Champion Avenue is right about here. So the point next year is gonna end up to be right about there. Um, so 1913 is the top row, the middle row is 1920, and then the bottom row is 1930. So you can see the number of businesses as they grow, and they tend to kind of start and more and more concentrate here on the Near East Side. <coughs> and here's the map I mentioned earlier. The vast majority of displaced residents resettled within 1.5 miles of their former housing. You can see the concentric greens, half mile each. And this is from one of the social scientific uh, studies that um, looked at uh, Point Dexter Village or the, or the end or the surrounding area. Architect Howard Dwight Smith was one of the uh, architects who helped design Point Exeter Village. And he spoke in front of his fellows in 1939 and said, let us consider for the moment that by the practice of socialized architecture, can you imagine saying that today? We refer to that form of advice in aesthetics and in technical service rendered by the professionally competent with first consideration for human needs rather than for per personal or professional gain. Um, and he was really trying to capture the spirit here of that sort of New Deal housing, that we were going to offer housing for that one-third of the nation ill-housed, right? The ideal espoused by FDR in his second inaugural. Which brings us to FDR's visit to Point Exeter Village on October 12, 1940, for sort of a official, unofficial commemoration. Point Exeter Village had already opened, of course, um, but he comes to town to kind of commemorate the opening um, as part of his visit. Um, and so Jimmy Rogers, just 11 years old at the time, whose eyes, quote, eyes still watered from paint fumes, the buildings were so new, was the lucky youngster chosen to meet this important visitor. Quote, he wore this beautiful hat with a brim turned up all the way around, Rogers later recalled when he was 56. Charismatic and warm, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt must have made quite the impression on young Jimmy, an African-American boy living on Columbus's Near East Side. The president was campaigning for re-election, and one can imagine how he turned on the charm. President Roosevelt, quote, had this way of throwing his head back, Rogers reminisced. He said, how do you like your new home? And I said, I like it a lot. <laughs> Marilyn Kendrick also remembers uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, stopping his car and getting out of the car and making his way up those steps. I mentioned them earlier at the administration building um, to wave to the crowd. Um, that had come to greet him there, right? 20,000 turning out to see him um, show up. Who's the guy with the big hands? So this, 
This is FDR oh. here. Um, and this is a painting by Amina Robinson um, of the day. And so here, you know, you probably just can't make it out here. Uh, Saturday, October 12, 1940, President Roosevelt in Poindexter Village. President Roosevelt had forsworn politics, of course, to inspect defense installations in advance. Yes. Huh? Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. The real reason he's here, right, you'll notice from this headline, is to visit Fort Hayes. And that's. The majority of the newspaper coverage that day is him, you know, giving solemn salutes, and he's, he, I think he lays a, a wreath um, at, at the uh, Columbus Memorial um, and things like that, right? Um, and he, and he has also in his motorcade, I believe it's the, it's the Columbus mayor and then the governor are in with him, um, both Republicans at the time. And he was in the city for how long? Um, I think it's something like eight hours. Um, and his, his actually, his presidential schedule, I like this, um, something in uh, how you balance historical sources. Um, his presidential schedule actually doesn't schedule him stopping at Poindexter. Um, so I have a few oral history accounts that say he did get out and he waved to the crowd. Um, and I can just imagine how freaked out his kind of handlers were. That day. So like, no, we have to get you moving. You have to get back on your plane soon. Um, we have to keep campaign slash not campaign. Um, so I want to focus now a little bit on what the community they formed at Poindexter looked like. Um, and they really transformed these houses into homes. Um, and Amita Robinson here, whose artwork I've used here to kind of symbolize this a little bit, says it was the kind of community where hardworking families flourished. I could not do or produce the artwork without Poindexter Village and the families and extended families. Um, and for those of you who haven't uh, heard of Amina Robinson, she was a MacArthur Fellowship winning artist um, and is perhaps, I would say, almost assuredly the most famous artist from Columbus. Um, mutuality, another great shot here um, that's at the uh, Columbus Museum of Art. Um, quote Julie Whitney Scott says, the term village wasn't just a noun, it was an action word. It meant there were elders in the immediate area that took care of you while your parents went to work. They watched over you while you played in the courtyard. They taught us respect for our elders and respect for ourselves and each other. She grew up in Poindexter during the 1960s. Poindexter Village was also uh, a hot spot for some civil rights activism um, during the 1940s with an organization called the Vanguard League, which was the preeminent uh, civil rights organization in Columbus. Um, during the time. Um, it would merge later with the Urban League in the 1960s, um, but they focused primarily through lawsuits like the NAACP to challenge discrimination in restaurants, hotels, and public spaces, but they also became involved in some housing issues. And Point Extra Village was a place where they often met or organized um, around their actions. They also had membership drives and that sort of thing at Point Extra Village. Um, so, uh, for example, negotiations over conflict uh, made its way to the regional and then the national offices in 1942. Here we can see in our uh, newspaper headline in the top left. Um, with the help of Con Congress of Industrial Organizations, Representative John Thornton, the Point Extra Residences Committee and the Vanguard League succeeded in rolling back the large and sudden rent increases via picketing and a dramatic march in City Hall. Um, and so, this, I didn't find much evidence of the kind of surviving past this, and a lot of actually oral history residents didn't talk a ton about civil rights activism in their histories, um, but it certainly was something that played a part in the community here, um, as especially early years, really important early years of community formation taking place here. It was also a place that um, former residents, though, talked a lot about in terms of safety. It was a place they felt safe um, because of their uh, uh, fellow neighbors. Um, Leslie Bridges says, actually, Point Dexter was the best place to grow up. Those were fond memories because all the parents looked out for the kids. We could sleep out all night, and we did in tents, and we would sleep with our doors open. And Leslie's actually uh, the daughter of Aretha here. Oh yes, what happened is we had a chain out there of women, and we would tell each one what was going on in the neighborhood. And she then goes on to tell me about how essentially there was essentially a block watch of sorts um, of women who would keep an eye on the neighborhood and if something was going on they'd tell each other and then they'd report to the police if it needed to get that far. Um, it didn't sound like it usually did. Um, and she was also then is kind of 
important, interesting to know. It was great to interview Aretha Edwards, a great privilege. Um, she's one of the first residents of Poindexter Village, um, and so it was really wonderful to be able to speak to her um, and her daughter. Um, and then Cindy Maskin says, the bottom line was that if somebody was in trouble that lived out there and they had support, if they just reached out and said something, um, and I found this comment really interesting because it came from the later decades when a lot of residents had kind of concluded that Poindexter was kind of falling a bit victim to general neighborhood decline, um, increasing poverty, increasing neglect, um, larger forces that were kind of wearing down the neighborhood, being cut off by I-71, giant other urban renewal projects going on nearby, uh, Mount Vernon and 20th Street, um, those sorts of things going on. Um, but she still felt moving into this place even later on that this community that had taken shape in earlier decades was so strong that actually she still felt it going on and, and wanted her oral history recorded. Um, and so Stephen Paco Greer, also a former resident who grew up in Point Exeter Village um, during the 1960s, um, uh, I have a little audio clip of his here, but I don't think we'll be able to hear it, so I'll just have to kind of um, quickly uh, give a brief idea of what he talks about. He talks about how Point Exeter Village was really connected to um, the thoroughfares of Mount Vernon and Long Street, how there were a bunch of stores there that they could have access to. And so even though they were cut off from downtown because they felt it was racially segregated from them, right? Um, that they still had kind of everything they needed nearby in the area. This really goes against that sort of idea that public housing developments are cut off from the surrounding areas, that they're kind of uh, separate communities from everywhere else. He also, though, talks about, um, now that I'm remembering here, instead of playing the, being able to play the audio clip, um, he also talks about how there were uh, music clubs and theaters on every corner. It was like 52nd Street in New York, he says. Um, and that's a place where, so he always felt he had a place to showcase his skills, as, as, as how he puts it. Um, and he actually later goes on to play with um, folks like Tito Puente and things like that. He becomes a very successful mu musician, drummer, um, later on, jazz musician. Um, Daniel Sturkey um, was a former resident of Point Exeter Village, really grew up there, um, and later became a professional social worker for 30 years, which I think is really important. Um, it is important to note because in, in one of the um, snippets here from his oral history, he talks about how um, the women who raised him in Point Exeter Village really made him the person he was today, and not just himself, but they made a bunch of other people who came out of Point Exeter Village successful because of the community and values they instilled in people coming out of there. <clears throat> and then in the second audio clip, he gives this great little story about how he ran to the store, uh, Carl's Brown Grocery Store, um, which has been recently demolished as well. Um, uh, he ran there for the store, he had just gotten a new bike for his birthday, it was his first new bike, he was like seven years old, he sets it down for just a moment, he comes back and of course it's gone, he's devastated, um, but then a week later or so, he doesn't really say a week, he just says sometime later, um, there was an older woman across the street from him, and a new bike shows up in his house, and she had bought him a new bike because she saw that his got stolen, um, and I think even though, right, this is an instance of a bike getting stolen, right, that happens everywhere, um, this woman across the street who just had no blood relation to him at all, right, goes out of her way. These are not rich people, right? These are not just like, oh, we'll just buy the kid another bike, right? His parents couldn't do that. Um, and he gives this really touching story about how she went out of his way to, to and he gets fairly emotional when he tells that story, too. Um, it's, it's a really great story. Um, and, so connected have people become to this place that um, actually today's fight for historic preservation of Point Exeter Village was not the first time this has happened. Um, not necessarily a fight, but that folks in uh, 1980 also commemorated Point Dexter Village's, uh, I guess, then already history, right? Um, where we have folks coming together to do some events around the administration building. Um, here we have a couple gentlemen, who, one of whom uh, remembers FDR's visit as well. Um, and we see them using, right, the before and after sort of shots here um, in, the, in the newspaper coverage. So as I move to start wrapping up here, hmm? Do you need more water? Uh, no, I'm okay for, for so far. Um, we, we'll see. Um, and so recently, though, there has been a, a conflict to preserve Point Extra Village. Um, in the face of, of redevelopment. Um, CMHA, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, um, announced in 2008 
um, that it was to demolish Poindexter Village as part of a larger redevelopment of the Near East Side. Um, that includes uh, OSU East Hospital, um, Taylor Avenue, that whole area. If you've driven by, you've maybe seen signs or you've seen other kind of announcements about redevelopment. OSU pledged $10 million to the area. That was part of this uh, redevelopment sort of uh, overall um, idea. Community stakeholders learned of the plan after they announced it. Um, they protested and formed the Coalition for Responsible and Sustainable Development on the Near East Side. Um, and this is going to be a very bare bones uh, uh, walk through here of the conflict here that's going on. Um, some of the takeaways though here are that the coalition forces uh, the legally required, federally required 106 review process. Um, that it is pretty clear the CMHA had no intent upon doing. Um, and they, as part of that, they move, uh, they get a historical review panel uh, assembled which recommends the preservation of 10 of the 35 housing structure buildings um, and listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it does not achieve listing on the National, Re National Register despite being eligible, very eligible you might say. Um, CMHA chooses to demolish all but two of the 35 housing structures instead of demolishing all 35. Um, it's still unclear today what will happen to those last two. There's a proposal by the Point Extra Legacy Foundation to rehab the buildings into a museum or cultural center and or art space and or there's actually a few other really interesting ideas um, in their proposal for that. Um, and then there's also a, a semi-counter proposal that propped up after theirs showed up. Um, but that gets into some insider baseball that we don't need to deal with. Um, and there's, uh, but also successfully, there's going to be a year-long museum exhibit at Columbus Historical Society, which is housed in COSI, um, beginning April 2016, and funded largely by CMHA. Um, and that was also forced by the coalition. Um, CMHA signed a memorandum of agreement, and part of that was that CMHA would provide some sort of museum exhibit. The language I think CMHA intended to be vague enough that that could be anything from a real museum exhibit to essentially a glass case put up in the new housing that they're building now. Um, but continuous pressure from um, community stakeholders has required them to, to really make this a museum exhibit. And it's going to be something um, pretty excellent, I think, um, here at Columbus Historical Society. Um, and they also, though, sparked larger interest in Columbus about the history of Poindexter and the African American Near East Side as a whole. And I think it's part of a, a larger interest on the Near East Side um, in African American history there. You know, you see the uh, history wall on Long Street. Um, people are continuously interested in Lincoln Theater. Um, there's lots of sorts of historical activities going on, uh, especially on the Near East Side. Just both kind of realize that there's a real rich history here that's been overlooked. And you might say, well, National Register of Historic Places, I thought that was, you know, for Thomas Jefferson's Monticello or places with John Rockefeller's name attached to them or whatever, right? Um, but actually, there's 33 public housing developments listed on the National Register of Historic Places mapped here. A couple of them have two locations in them. Atlanta has two, for example. Um, and they're really spread out. If you remember my map from earlier of New Deal, uh, public housing construction across the United States, it really mirrors a lot of that um, construction, right? And there's a reason I chose these three housing developments in the earlier photograph as well, right? These three are listed on the National Register. Lothrop, Santa Rita Courts, and Iberville um, in New Orleans. And so I just want to conclude with a few quotes from folks um, when I ask them why the buildings should be preserved. Quote, when I drive down Long Street anymore, I don't even turn to the right. It's just an emotional thing for me. Like I said, I grew up there. My parents raised me there. Paco Greer, former resident. Quote, I mean, if you don't get the physical thing there, they don't mean anything there. I mean, we can talk about these places, but if we got nothing left from it that we can see and touch, it don't really mean nothing. Baba Shango, former resident. Quote, architecture tells a story. When you tear down buildings, you get rid of the story. No, here's what I tell my kids. If you don't save your history and know your history, you're going to be doomed to make the same mistakes that others have made in history. There are some repercussions behind destroying the buildings because you are talking about people's history. 
If you destroy people's history, there are re repercussions behind that. There really are. Calvin Hairston, friend and family of former residents. Quote, one thing that has been one of my pet peeves as far as Poindexter Village is, con is concerned is down through the years, you know, I hate to hear them call Poindexter a project because Poindexter came as a village. And one thing you felt in the village was love. You knew you were loved. Sybil Edwards, former resident. Quote, history is important. That what you do in your life is important. That when you do something or you see something, it can last. It's significant. If you tear away and take away everything from people that they have, and if they just, and they have pride in, you leave them with nothing. Julie Whitney Scott, former resident. Quote, I'd love to be able to go there and say, well, see that over there? I had a place I grew up. It looks just like that. They tore it down, but that's what's left of it. And Roosevelt came here and dedicated this. Yeah, I wanted a piece of it to be there. Daniel Sturkey, former resident. Point Extra Village, quote, Point Extra Village is as important to me as the Eiffel Tower is to Paris. Rita Smith, local historian and former resident. These are just a few of the answers from former residents when they talk about uh, why Point Extra Village should be preserved. During the oral histories I conducted, interviewees became as passionate as when they asked directly, never became as passionate as when I asked them directly about the value of historic preservation. What came across in every instance is that they care deeply about a place which the public and CMHA, in all likelihood, have dismissed as simply the projects. And that's all I have prepared for you. Thank you. Uh, so if there are other questions, lingering questions, um, I would be happy to, to answer as best I can. Where was, yes. the, where was the political community in terms of the demolition? Where, how, how, did, how did the political community and the, uh, where was the dispatch one? Or were they engaged, was they engaged? And where, did, and where did the mayor, where, were the, where was the political language? Um, so they were uh, for the redevelopment and demolition. Um, they were uh, the city, the housing authority, and OSU uh, belong to Partners Achieving Community Transformation, um, the organization in charge of the redevelopment project of the entire area. Um, and so they essentially were for the project as a whole. Um, and, and how no one in those organizations said, well, wait, let's put a pause button on this and, and start talking to some folks who live there before we do this. I don't know how that, I mean, one thing that occurs to me is that there weren't any historians on their staff, right? <laughs> they, just, they just knew best. Yeah, exactly, right? And I, I, think, I think, and this is something I, I, I almost included in my dissertation research and just kind of proved one thing too many. Um, my impression of urban planning as a profession is it's very present focused. Um, and, and they're kind of always thinking that they're doing something new. Um, and they're not super aware of what they've done before. Um, and I think it's just, yeah, they knew best, and they were full steam ahead, sort of thing. Yeah. History may not always exactly repeat itself, but sometimes it sure does rhyme. Sure, it really does. It really does. <laughs> yeah. Jim, that's great. So this is sort of a general question about public housing mm -hmm. uh, during the New Deal era. And you alluded to this when you said that uh, there were lots of places, there were grocery stores in the neighborhood. But, so when these and I don't want to use the word project, but, but in, the more, in the more generic mm -hmm. meaning of the word, when these projects were developed, was was that a conscious was it a conscious effort like across the country to create communities where there was sort of multimodal? Uh, what yeah, was that sort of thing kind of intentional? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, this is obviously something that's very important today, like, you know, multi-use. Yeah, and so this really connects great to the last question and comment, because I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, new urbanists think they invented this sort of idea, right? Um, but here we see with Point Extra Village, we have a church, we have a school, we have a recreation center, and we have two streets where you can buy everything you need, right? Um, it's the New England town, right? Um, and, it's, and it's very much on a human scale, right? I mean, you before they... Demolish it. it was very easy to walk across the thing and you know not very long five minutes time right it's a very human scale walkable place making sort of uh, you know to use all the phrases people like today in urban planning it's it's very friendly to those ideals yeah they also had a turn of the century German social engineering theory that was just that was just beginning to emerge 
Yeah, definitely. And they, they definitely really grabbed onto the, uh, all those sorts of international modernist styles, right? Um, the Zell, oh, and I've never really pronounced this kind of name spoken in German. The Zellenbau style um, is specifically what this is designed afterwards. Um, but it also looks like the English Garden City ideal in many ways, right? Um, <coughs> these sorts of international modernist kind of planning ideas very much influenced all of those New Deal public housing developments. Look, there's a village green right in the middle. Yeah, it's exactly. Like right? Yeah, and there's, a, there's a green here, and then there's and then there's green in between each one. Uh, they had flower growing contests, and people had gardens. Um, you know, these sorts of private place sorts of things very much going on <coughs> in these public housing uh, uh, homes. Right? Utopian by design, almost. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Rita. Well. Um, when we think about what it replaced, the binary patch, and it was just a smaller section, it, it wasn't that greater section. Right. But those that came and were living in the Blackberry patch, it was still a place of safety because they had migrated from the deep south. So even though the house may have been the deep, not the most comfortable and, and yeah, the physical you know, housing, was, right? But it was safe. It was a sense of community. It was safe. It was home. It was where I can be. Um, but it was replaced. But it became, I say, the mecca of the area. It was a, when you think about the whole East Side as a um, community for the Afro American. Uh, population, it was self-contained. It was the Mecca. It was where everybody, it was a village. When it was called a village, it was a village. Um, I had a two and a two and a half hour conversation the other day with two ladies that grew up there. Um, and I mean, it's like yesterday for them because everyone looked after each other. It was what we would call community. Um, everybody was everybody's parent. The playgrounds were sacred. I remember going to the community center for my teenage dances Yeah, a lot back of folks talk day. about the Baby Recreation um, Center. Yeah. It had steam yeah. heat. So it, had it had steam heat. Steam. Where that community building is located, it had a steam something. I don't know what the terminology would have been for it. But um, um, the residents, there was lists because you had people, uh, the soldiers that were out at, uh, we call it Lockburn, right? It was Lockburn, Lockburn. South Coast. Yes, that were soldiers. That was affordable housing. But it, it had the steam heat, it had the newest. Uh, appliances, it was the place to live, and it was a safe and affordable. Um, yeah, Calvin, Calvin Harrison has a couple great quotes that he gave during yes. his oral history about how it was the place to be, right? It was. It was the place I, I to get was into. a formal resident as a newlywed and a young mother. Um, you could leave your children in your yard and everyone looked after. Those courtyards were important. Uh, to the community. It's interesting, Mr. Smith worked also, the architect also worked on your uh, state stadium. Yeah, yeah. And he built up a few other city right, buildings as right. well. Right, right. So it, and it's interesting if, if you think about what African villages are like, that was the concept of an African village. Everyone looks after everyone and it, everyone came together. So it was interesting that Poindexter had that kind of history. But the one thing that I don't hear people speak of was the high standards that were required of every resident that lived there. And it was after the 70s, after the urban renewal, that it was allowed to deteriorate. Misbehavior was not allowed. Uh, in fact, Patsy was saying that someone had moved in and they had used the swear word and the father took that father to task 
for using a swear a swear word. It was not allowed. It's a good thing I didn't play my wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ju Julie Whitney Scott talks about how uh, she and, and uh, broke a window with a baseball. Um, and, and instead of going to get the management to fix this, they, they went to the store and bought a new pane of glass and he, her, her dad showed her how to fix the glass and they fixed it. Um, and uh, Daniel Sturkey talks about how folks would go out in the, the, the brick patios there, they would go out and pour salt water on it and get the little grass out from between all the little places to keep it looking nice. Um, and that sort of kind of commitment to keeping the place looking really nice. <clears throat> so, so bring us back to the beginning. Why does this image persist? This is you know, convincing and persuasive, right? Why does the Good, image persist? <laughs> thank you. Good. I hope it is. <laughs> so why does the image persist then that public housing is an unmitigated disaster and all the sorts of things you begin with? Why, why does that image persist? Um, this is a really great question. Um, and I think it's a really hard one. I think in historiography, for one, we love the big examples. We love the focus on Chicago. Um, pruitt Igo is a fantastical sort of story, right? It's built and destroyed in two decades, essentially. Um, it's humongous, right? We, we love to talk about those places. Um, that's one. But I think in a, the broader sense, which I think is what you're really asking about, um, I, I think it has to do with really deeply rooted ideals about private property. United States. Um, there's all really always been since it was proposed. Um, the historian really hesitated to say always, um, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to say always a really strong push against uh, things that can be considered um, uh, collectivist, collectivist, um, communal, right? Um, those sorts of ideas, as opposed to kind of you know the Lockean ideal of private property. Um, everything specifically from everything from the big abstract idea there to the kind of specific real estate interests that really shape 1937 legislation, 1949 legislation to limit the scope of public housing um, to make sure that you are only replacing demolished units when you demolish housing there. Um, Port Dexter Village is obviously a, a, a special wonderful place, but it can't be exceptional, can it? That, yeah, that's one thing. I, I don't think it is. Um, I think there are lots of other places that created communities in places like these. I think part of its success came from its design. Um, it was on that human scale. It intentionally had courtyards between units. Um, front doors faced each other so you could you know, walk out and start talking to your neighbor or watch you know, your neighbor's kids, things like that. Um, but I think it's very much a different style from that post-war kind of super block, giant high-rise sort of thing. Here in the Jeanette? Let me proffer as a theory, sort of in relation to David's question. Yeah, excellent. This, this was developed at a time when there was a strong nuclear family. Mm -hmm. Pruitt Igo came 30 years later. Right, right. And, and sociologically, I don't know if this is absolutely accurate, but, but about the time that the, the concept of the nuclear family, for whatever reason, <coughs> right, myriad right. of reasons, was really beginning to disintegrate. <laughs> no, I suspect there's some. Theory. I suspect there's some, some corpus there. Yeah, that, really that, that, yeah. That, that, that goes to your point about the care of the community. You had a nuclear family. And, and one, actually, one thing some public housing historians have, have noted is that um, your ratio to adults to children actually has a lot to do with how successful and stable your public housing development is. If there's too many children to too few adults, things get out of control pretty quick. Um, which, which kind of seems common sense, right? You're like, well, yeah. Um, but, but on the other hand, it's, you know, it took a long time for both. And that's actually a really great idea, and it connects to that other. Is that's that the War of the Flies theory? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess that's right. Uh, Janelle? So you mentioned earlier, and I'm not an urban historian by any means, but you were talking about how like there's this common idea that you know these were not successful things, and they look primarily like Chicago and um, New York City. Are there any other projects similar to what you've done that are focused on maybe similar developments in more, I guess you could say modern, moderate sized cities mm -hmm. that have, I don't know, like similar results so that way for Dr. Staley's question, 
is this the exception, or is it? I'm just wondering if there's some kind of relationship between large city versus moderate sized city. I don't know. Um, there's not necessarily. So, uh, Nick, not to get too many specifics, Nicholas Dagan Bloom has a great book on New York City. Um, and his book is called, uh, It Gives the Ending Away, Public Housing That Worked. Um, and he really argues that public housing in New York worked because it was managed well and they chose their tenants really carefully. Um, which means they didn't let a lot of poor folk in, is what he ends up arguing. Um, which has some problems to it, right? You can kind of see where that argument leads to, right? Um, but, and one other problem with his book is he really only looks at New York City Housing Authority records. He doesn't look at really any kind of community-based records at all. Um, but he shows fairly convincingly that New York's public housing was managed fairly well. If you keep the elevators running well and you keep things clean and you, you know, get rid of the graffiti right away when it shows up, it works pretty well and people are pretty pleased with it. Um, and as long as you fund it well enough, right? Um, New York City's been really the only city big enough to fund some of its own public housing without federal dollars. No other city's been able to do that. So it's, in some ways, New York City's almost an exception in a big city sense. Um, but I, I would hesitate to say the point of is exceptional of the small. I suspect if you looked at San Rita Courts or Iberville, you'd see really similar stories. Um, and one thing I found really engaging about this specific topic and why I think it's so important is the kind of public history conflict that it erupted and that connection between you know, the folks who live <coughs> that history and then fighting to preserve that history in the face of another round of urban redevelopment, I guess. Jim? Well, wouldn't that, then maybe this is, maybe I'm just resetting my so but isn't this possibly a function of, of the size of the of the development, yeah. because I would I would argue that public housing would be most successful when it is smaller units integrated in a neighborhood that has a mixture of private and public housing, yeah. you know, rental and homeowner. Mm -hmm. And so when you have these massive blocks, I mean, yeah, I mean, look what, at this footprint. I mean, my yeah, I mean that's God. Right? And look at the housing next to it, right? These are, you know, three, two, three story housing next to 11 story towers, 33 of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. Soviet, they're like Soviet block. Yeah, yeah. yeah it looks exactly like right. It looks a lot like some of OSU's dorms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the yeah. road I go is truly depressing. I've been, I was, it was yeah, so there. one, yeah, it's, it's kind of easy for me to compare it, you know, as like the opposite case to Purai, because it's, it's, it's the bad exceptional case, right? Um, it it is it is this shot, right? Which was which is which was incredibly famous when it came down, right? Um, this was on you know every news magazine, every news show, right? Um, and so maybe one more question here before we wrap up, Rita. And I would say because it was on a smaller scale, it was it blended in with the total neighborhood. Yeah, and I think so great it and and. Um, so it wasn't something like that that didn't uh, fit the whole uh, footprint of yeah. the total neighborhood. But then you have to remember it was also in the midst of segregation. So our mm -hmm. business community surrounded it. Yeah. And our educational system surrounded it. So it, I think what you were saying, it, it was unique. And, and, and the full system, right, you have doctors and lawyers living there along with the folks working at the factory and things like that, right? It was, it was a whole community there in that segregated neighborhood, um, which is, yeah, which is a really interesting issue to think through, right, um, in the United States history. So I guess we're going to wrap it up there since we're running out of time. So, so and you, and you, thank you, and you've uh, already got my first question for your dissertation. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you all for coming. Yes. And of course, you have good luck then on this uh, defense. <laughs> Thank you.